Welcome to The Miracle You, guiding you on the journey towards finding passion and purpose and how to discover, create, and live a life by your design. Whether your success has been plentiful or your missed opportunities have been overwhelming, we can help you become a more empowered, masterful person and show you how to share your gift with the world. It's time to inspire change from within with the host of The Miracle You, Vince Kramer. Hello, Imagination. I'm Vince Kramer, your host, and welcome to The Miracle You, where you learn about the magic of living your life by finding the example in real life. Every single thing that happens in our life has a gift in it. And it's in finding that gift where we can really move forward and living our purpose in a way that supports us on our journey to that miracle life that we deserve, to our birthright. Today's guest is going to share with us how she found some gifts in her darkness and how taking one small step at a time is really living her purpose in a way that's moving her towards sharing herself with the world in a way that we're going to bring humanity together. I'm with Andrea J. Lee today, and it is an honor for me to bring Andrea to you. She is an in-demand speaker and trainer on the topic of emotional abuse and violence prevention and CEO of Thought Partners International, a boutique consulting firm. Described by clients as a hands-on, back-pocket CEO, Andrea's strengths lie in helping innovative ideas get traction in the market. Her clients create leveraged, sustainable income in alignment with their values. What Andrea loves most is to shift our culture and create the better world she believes is possible. Andrea, what a powerful statement, and I'm so glad to have you here today. Are you ready to share the miracle of you? I am. I am ready, Ben. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, thanks for being here with us. You know, um, Andre and I have known each other for a little over a year now, and she's not only a friend, but a mentor and a co-collaborator in, in several different ways. So I know so much more about her than that short little bio gave you. Could you share a little bit more with us, Andre, about who you are and, and what you're all about? Oh, Vince, you know, I think at Essence, I, um, my life is here to help us find peace. Um, my middle name in Chinese, I have a Chinese name because my parents are from Taiwan, um, is the character for peace. Um, and for a long time, I had no clue why that was. <laughs> Um, but I recently um, have really connected with that. And so when you ask me who I am, I, I have to really tune into that and just say, mm, everything I do, each breath I take, I try to have it contribute to peace. Uh, definitely our mission. And, and that kind of goes to some of the stuff that we talk about in Imagine Miracles, that we actually come in with a divine intent, we're here for, a, for truly a, a mission and a very powerful mission, and we're living it all along the way, but it doesn't necessarily need to look like we're living it on the, all along the way as we're really coming to find a little bit more about ourselves. Can, can you go a little bit more in, as you're bringing peace? What does that look like as, as your mission in the world? It starts with me tuning myself and learning and developing myself as an instrument of peace. So whether it be in how I conduct my own speech with my family and my community, how I help other people to communicate, because that's a big part of my work, the kind of writing or presenting or teaching or coaching that I do out in the world, it has this center, central pillar. Lots of times people get confused and overwhelmed and um, even caught up in the drama um, that that actually is quite violent, even though that might be a big word to use to, just, to describe it. Um, there's kind of an inherent feeling of violence in a lot of our everyday uh, interactions. So I try to hold the energy of peace, but also be very practical about how to communicate uh, so that 
fractious and sometimes conflicted situations can return to peace. And, and that's the beginning of it, I think, Vince. So many of us live in chaos all the time. Could you share a few ideas of how you can bring yourself into that peace? Yeah, one of the fundamental questions I like to use is to just keep myself oriented uh, by where am I now? Um, so it's four very simple words. Where am I now? Even in this moment, you know, tuning to our listeners in imagination, where are we right now? And I don't know if you can feel it, but whenever I ask that question, it's like um, tuning into the North Star for me. When I know where I am, when I can uh, sense with my physical self as well as my energetic self, my own presence, that calms me, that allows me to relate differently to the different things that are happening in my life, the different people, the different sometimes awful things that are going on in the world. When I know where I am, I know I'm okay. Yes, when, when we get to ground zero, and when I say ground zero, we're actually grounded into us, it's so much easier to see the world in a, in a way that isn't against us or for us or, or pushing us in one direction or pulling us in the other. So I, I know exactly where you're coming from, and that, that is so powerful. You know, every one of us has some kind of wake-up call there to really get us into us, to, to bring us from that place where uh, we're, we're living life and developing gifts and talents and learning from the high vibrations and the low vibrations. Can you share one of your wake-up calls with us? Sure. It, is it okay to say that it was when the police came to my apartment? <laughs> If it isn't okay, you've already said it. Oops. <laughs> and I won't edit it out. <laughs> it was when the police came to the door events. Um, and it was a, it happened at a time when I really wasn't, you know, what I, what we've just described. I, I wasn't present. I was um, very much part of the, I would say, the chaos, as you referred to it. Um, out of my body, walking around like a meat sack, really, like a, like a head on a stick. <laughs> um, and when the police came, it was like a boom, boom, boom on the door that in some ways really called forward my attention from this zoned out, spaced out place that I had been in. It woke me up to the reality that I had created a lot of violence in my life. I had been expressing my anger and taking it out on my husband um, and, uh, you know, yelling and throwing things and lots of rageful stuff, honestly. When that external situation occurred where two policemen, not just one policeman, <laughs> two, <laughs> came to our apartment door, we were newly married very, very soon after we got married, we had known each other for quite some time, but um, we had just recently gotten married. And they looked at my husband as if he had been beating me, because I guess uh, we had neighbors who cared enough to say, hey, something's not right in that apartment. We need the police. Um, so they came and knocked. And, um, you know, because of the way our society constructs reality and the narrative around violence within a marriage, Immediately, my husband was suspect. Mike is um, goodness in human form. <laughs> um, and so when they looked, when the police looked at him with those eyes that said, you know, they made that assumption that he had been beating me, it's what, it's that moment of coming online that this is wrong. It's not okay. It's me that has the issue. I am the one that was emotionally being abusive, verbally being abusive. Um, that dark, dark moment, that crushing, horrifying, dawning realization, I was not okay. Um, and I was not behaving in an okay way. Finally pierced through, and I began my journey of climbing out of that. One of the things I'd like to ask you, Andrea, is... Um, and, and I'd like to come back to this wake up because it's so powerful and, and it really speaks to a lot of people. 
Were there little wake up calls along the way that you missed? Yeah. I mean, I can only say that with hindsight, right? I, right. I didn't know I was missing them then. But if I look back, definitely I think that there were little wake up calls that I I didn't rationally connect with, but that I think my the essence of me responded to. So there was a wake up call at the at, I think I was about fourteen, um, as close as I could remember it. I was a, I was a teenager, early teens, um, and I remember saying to a friend, you know, if this is how it feels to be a child in a family with violence in it, I am never going to have children ever, ever, ever. And it was a vow I made that I think was my unconscious, mm -hmm. my unconscious, unconscious, <laughs> hard word to say sometimes, talking to me, responding right. to those, a little wake up call um, in my life at that time. Right. The miracle you in, in the podcast, we really want to help people see that there are little wake ups along the way and, and hindsight helps us find them. But if we can find them earlier, it might save us from some of these big ones. And and for you, two policemen showing up at your door was pretty big, especially when you, you knew that they were looking at Mike as the one that was the the instigator and the problem in the area. But after the wake-up call and, and you started your movement towards who you are right now, how did that change your life? How did it ex accelerate you? You know, it's funny because I think, like, one of the things that I believe so strongly in is that we really, the dark is uh, here to serve us. Like, those dark times um, are actually some of our, like, I consider those dark times to be friends in my life. They're um, some of my best friends are, are those dark times. They're the, Those dark times are like the friend who, is willing to tell you that you have a really big booger in your nose. <laughs> you know, only a really good friend would tell you that, right? Those dark times helped me to hold me in a cocoon, which is a dark place, um, to gestate um, in, in the, that right context um, that something deep wants to transform. And so... Being held by that wake up call and in those dark times, yeah, I, I really look back at that. I, I, I couldn't have become the person I, I am now, um, or you know, become the person who I hope I'm still becoming uh, without those allies. It's very interesting, and it's but it's also very difficult to look back at those times and see that there was really a gift in there for us, and such a powerful gift, as you said, you know, some of the most important things that have happened to you, the things that have carried you even further into your life were the little gifts from the dark times, but it's so difficult. The, the things like we, we really like to share with Imagine Miracles is the fact that our definition of a miracle is through an act of love, sharing your gifts and talents with the world so others can share theirs. What's the miracle in Andrea J. Lee? I think... If there is a miracle, it is that I, I, I am willing and eager to talk about the hardest things. I experienced miracle of the definition you describe in the love of my husband, Mike, who loved me through um, those really dark times. And it has forged me into a person who is pretty fearless about looking into the dark together, finding a way to say the tough things, finding a way to engage um, at the biggest, you know, deepest levels of what's hard and being able to, you know, sometimes with a, a, a smile say, well, geez, that's kind of really awful. <laughs> and, and, and like, you know, sustain the dialogue necessary to get through that stuff. Can, can you give us an example of how you've done that in some of your work? Sure. 
I mean, whether it's with a business owner who finally has to come to terms with the fact that what they've been trying to build based on the model that they've been taught after a lot of money has been spent is, is the wrong thing and they have to give it up and start from scratch. Um, looking in the, the, the jaws of that reality that it's like this thing that I've been trying for years and spent lots of money on is, has been wrong. It's been misaligned with my essence. And, you know, that's an example. Another example is in my work now with abusers, women who will look me in the face tears streaming from their eyes, desperate for forgiveness that they have enacted such violence on their children or their spouses or their parents. Let's look at that together. Let's not let this miracle of being awake to the the darkness go um, unharvested. Let's, Let's abide. Let's go steady. Let's walk together through the toughest of that sort of integration um, and, then, and then get to breathe again, get to uh, see the light again. It, it takes so much inner strength to be able to hold that space for other people. And I can say from experience that you hold that space very, very well. Could you give the listeners an idea of your way of holding space for people so they can they can find themselves in that darkness? Yeah, I I recently found a way to articulate this. I don't know, I think that our listeners would be able to relate, Vince, that we live in a very loud world. Yeah, it's fairly extroverted for the most part. Um, obviously, extroversion is expressive and talkative and gregarious, so it's the part that we often hear and see the most. But putting that aside, what I came to realize, especially in scenarios where I'm presenting with other leaders or maybe I'm involved in a political campaign with um, lots of people who are marching and placards and loud chanting and stuff like this, that my way of holding space actually has more to do with being a container. If extroversion is the sun, I gain a lot of personal um, strength from relating to the moon. So where other people are being that outgoing, hot, you know, bright um, persona, I'm hanging on to that um, sort of quieter, cooler, shining um, persona and it really grounds me. It is not just, I think, um, a good alignment for who I am, but it, it also helps me to see the contrast that, yes, we need the sun. It's all good, beautiful. Look at all the leaders out there who are shining like the sun. But we also need the moon. And so for anyone who's listening who relates to that, maybe that is a way of thinking of the container. I also use briefly two other analogies Um, I I tune into for holding space, and that is the ears. Um, Two ears, Vince, I don't know if you've noticed, but one of my favorite things to say is two ears together is the shape of a heart. (laughs) Um, The shape of a heart is two ears, everybody. Um, And so, yeah, if I I ever need a pick-me-up, a reminder that my purpose is here to um, you know, hold those ears in the shape of a heart and help these conversations um, uh, come forward. It, it's also to help other people remember that they have two ears they could put in the shape of a heart as well. And perhaps that moon energy would help them too. You brought something up that I, I think a lot of us have issue with, and, and that's the ability to to listen and hear. Do you have any secrets that you'd like to share with us? I'll tell you, in the context of my relationship with Mike, I played a game, um, and he knew something was up. Afterwards, he's like, I knew you were doing something different. (laughs) Um, And it's sort of a tool that um, is applicable in relationship, in client work, in um, being out in the world, and that is um, wait wait for other people to talk. Like, don't be afraid to wait for other people to talk. 
Um, and that might sound funny, but, you know, in a, in a classic maybe stereotype of a marriage between a man and a woman, which is my case, you know, the woman is doing a lot of talking <laughs> in that relationship. It's a stereotype, a generalization, but that was definitely true for uh, Mike and I. So, you know, as far as getting better at listening, what I trained myself to do was to think of a conversation like a ping pong, a, a game of ping pong. If I had just finished saying something, then it wasn't my turn. Even if it took sometimes hours, Vince, <laughs> for Mike to give me a pong back in the form of something he said, that was his prerogative to take as long as he wanted to pong back. And that taught me so much about not just how to listen, but the quality of listening, that, that waiting for the pong back was part of listening. That is amazingly helpful. And, and uh, the analogy is absolutely perfect. So, so thank you for that. Well, one of the scariest things in the world is silence. For, <laughs> especially for, for us in the U.S., we, we don't like silence because there's so much chatter going on around us, like you said. So I really appreciate that. And I'm sure our, our listeners do also. And you know, there I know there's a lot going on in your life. Where would you like the next step to go? And and what would you like to do next? Maybe something that nobody else has heard yet. You know, your invitations are always so um they're so deep and I was thinking that, you know, it's becoming time to share this and so something that I'd really like to do is to finally say yes to more of a leadership role within the coaching profession. Um, and that might sound funny a little bit because to, in, to some degree, maybe I have done a thing or two in the coaching profession, but for me and the context that I've come from over the last 20 years as a coach, I know I actually have been holding back. I have been decentering myself. I have not volunteered to run for office for this leadership role. I have a pretty big vision. I've always had high expectations for us in the coaching and transformation world. I get annoyed very easily. That's how I know <laughs> um, that I have high expectations. And I mean, it's irresponsible of me to have high expectations and not step up. That's where I hope to go next. There's another mantra that we should all hold. It's irresponsible for us to have expectations and not to step up. Thank you for that one also. Because the bio was kind of patchy, share a little bit about your coaching history so people understand when you say that you've had a little bit to do with the coaching industry. So it was by sheer luck, really, another miracle, right, Vince, that I got into the coaching industry. I had been running my own first little business, which was a recruitment business called Eureka, <laughs> Eureka Recruitment. It was, uh, I loved my first logo. Um, and I got tired of it because um, I was helping great people find work inside these organizations that were treating them like crap, frankly. So I, I felt this like moral and kind of ethical dilemma. So I gave myself a sabbatical and I volunteered to be a transcriptionist for a coach training company at the time called Coachville. And within six weeks of my transcribing for them, I became the general manager <laughs> of that company. Um, and we grew that company, which was the first online coach training company from like six figures to like 3.2 million in about two, not quite two years. It was extraordinary a graduate school of coaching. Um, I was part of helping to form the International Association for Coaching, which is an accrediting body for the coaching industry. I was there in leadership helping to form. In 2003, when Thomas Leonard died, Thomas was um, what some you know, older veterans of the coaching industry considered to be the father, like the the person who put coaching on the map. He was the one that went on Donahue to get interviewed about coaching on Newsweek. He he was my first mentor, and it was his company that I was working for. Well, he passed away in 2003, suddenly at 47 of a heart attack. And I wrote in that year a book called Multiple Streams of Coaching Income, which is was the beginning of transforming the coaching industry from a one-on-one -on -one model, 
where all coaches did was trade time for money to a model where we could consider um, infusing products, groups, uh, workshops, all manner of things with the coaching spirit and coaching ethos. So there were those things. I don't know. There's a few other things probably in the, within the coaching world. But I, I think that the essence of it is to say that I think the future of coaching still has a lot coming. If the mission of the coaching profession has been to help people achieve their greatest potential, to help individuals achieve their greatest potential, what my current prayer is that we see the light that coaching actually has an even bigger mission, and that is to help humanity be the best it possibly can be as a collective, and that it's only through coaches coming together as a collective to bring our individual power into one pool, one giant circle of handshakes, um, hearts shaking hands, really, that if we can band together like that, then we can really help humanity rise. As we know, collective energy is so powerful. So I'm going to ask the imagination to come together to help see you step into that leadership role in coaching and to see coaching as a whole bring humanity together. Mm -hmm. We're going to hold that as a powerful energy with the collective imagination. Powerful. Thank you. I'd like to, to ask just one lightning round question on the way out. There's so many people listening to this podcast that feel like someone else can do it, someone else is better, you know, someone can... Someone else is going to be able to do what I can do, even though I want to. Can you share the biggest thing that is holding you back right now from experiencing the life that you wanted? Right now, mm -hmm. what's holding me back? Um, really, it, it, the, the answer is nothing. <laughs> um, there is nothing that should be holding me back. I think if there is something to say with regards to that, it's that not holding back can look like doing one small thing at a time. So there's a difference in it, like the energetic of, wow, this big mission and this big essence and big purpose. Um, how do we get this through into three-dimensional reality? <laughs> and more and more lately, Vince, honestly, I I am a fan of one small step at a time, one drop of our purpose at a time, one breadcrumb at a time. To me, if there is ever anything that gets me tired or um, despairing or throwing up my hands and like, oh, you know, I think I've done enough for this week. I don't know what else, you know, it's because I'm, I'm trying to birth my entire vision in one push. Um, that's not how it works. The devotion that's required and the confidence that we gain to overcome that, I, I, I don't know, this isn't for me, I, somebody else is going to do this, that we cannot overcome that by thinking about it. Okay, It's through proving to ourselves one small action at a time that this is our mission, that we can achieve our purpose that one drop at a time, that's where confidence comes from and that's where momentum comes from too. So. I, I kind of cheated. I knew that's where your answer was going to go. <laughs> and, that, and that's what I want to share with our listeners. Find one little thing and take that step and then celebrate yourself. Have the appreciation and the gratitude for the accomplishments that you make because at each one of those stones, as you unturn them, is really opening up to that big pathway that you're looking for. Even when a step is small, even if you think that the little move you're going to take towards that better world that you know is possible, even if you think it's just a tiny thing, you can be all of you in that small step. You can be whole. You can bring all of your essence to it. And so the size of the action does not need to mean only part of you is infused in it. And that's where the, the real like 
that heart energy, I think, that really drives and fuels and, and is exciting. It's like, wow, you know, that was art. You just did one small step in a whole way. I'm going to say congratulations and thank you for doing that in anticipation of you all doing that. And the whole world needs each of us. I know there's lots of people out there that want to know how to get a hold of you. How can people get in touch with Andrea J. Lee? Just go to andreajlee.com is my web home. I do lots of posting on Facebook. So if you want to, in addition, um, come follow me on Facebook. I'm at Andrea J. Lee. You can find me there. If you want to get a, a little bit more of a taste of my coaching style or anything like that, go to the Ask Andrea tab on my website. And you can sign up for some free classes. We can have some fun. And sometimes Vince likes to show up in those too. So we might get a, have a little reunion over there. Yeah, Vince does like to show up in there. Thank you so much for sharing so much of you with us today. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. On behalf of Mary and myself, have a miracle day. You've completed this episode of The Miracle You, but we have plenty more to help you discover your own personal passion and purpose. Head over to themiracleyou.com for free resources to assist you on your journey, as well as register for our free webinar, Discover Your Miracle Life, Three Mind Awakening Steps Toward Your Unique Purpose, or apply for a one-on-one -on -one Your Life, Your Way breakthrough session and discover your next best step on your journey. All available exclusively on our website. That's themiracleyou.com. We look forward to sharing more experiences of passion, purpose, and life by design next time, right here on The Miracle You.